So hello and welcome to the very first uh, IT online uh, webinar. So I'm your host and uh, tutor. My name is Jerry Naidu. And today I wanted to speak to you about the, the CPU or what many people rather like to call the, the brain of the computer. Um, so we're going to be going over a number of topics in, the, um, in this webinar. So uh, there's quite a few that we're going to be discussing. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the CPU itself, the functionality, um, as well as um, troubleshooting issues that uh, may occur with um, with the CPU itself. So yeah, let's not delay any further. Um, let's let's just jump right into it. Okay. So in this lesson, we're going to spend some time discussing the brain of the CPU, uh, or rather, oh, sorry, the brain of any computer system, and that's the central processing unit, uh, which we all call CPU or the the processor. So let's begin this lesson by discussing the role and the function of the of the CPU. So the CPU is an integrated circuit that's built um, on a slice of silicone um, and contains millions of microscopic circuits called logic gates. So they're all connected by um, hairline strands of uh, aluminum that work together uh, to, to store data and, and manipulate data. So the CPU can accept instructions or programs and, and execute uh, those instructions to perform both arithmetic um, and logical operations. So these instructions may tell uh, the CPU to perform, uh, perform tasks. So it could prompt the user to, to enter a series of numbers, uh, read the input from the system keyboard um, as the user types them, uh, store those numbers in specific memory locations in the system RAM, uh, use arithmetic functions to add all of those numbers together. Um, and then write those results uh, to a to a new location in the system RAM, um, and then write a message on the screen explaining the results, um, and then open a file on the hard drive, write the results to that file, or save the file and then close it. So you see, when when we say the CPU itself is the um, is the brains of the computer, you can see I'm really not kidding here. Um, without the CPU itself, none of the other components uh, in the system would be able to do anything. So the CPU connects, uh, connects to the rest of the system using a special socket on the motherboard. Uh, this socket contains a series of uh, many small connectors uh, into which you plug the CPU. And, and by doing this, uh, so, and, uh, and, and by doing this, the electrical connections are established uh, with the motherboard bus, which in turn, um, uh, sorry, with, which in turn connects the CPU to other components in your system, uh, like your system RAM, um, your storage devices, your video interface, and other, um, other components in your system, uh, or rather the expansion cards that are installed in the expan expansion slots. Uh, so the next thing we're going to be speaking about um, is uh, clock speed. So you need to be familiar with the CPU's, uh, CPU's clock speed. So the clock speed identifies the rate at which the CPU, um, sorry, the rate at which the CPU can execute instructions. So the clock speed is measured in gigahertz and the CPU requires a fixed number of clock ticks to execute an instructions. So uh, an instruction rather. So Generally speaking, the faster the CPU's clock speed, the more instructions it can execute per second. So the clock speed is very important. So understand that for all the components connected to the motherboard to communicate with each other, such as the RAM, the CPU, the expansion cards, uh, the components must be synchronized to the same clock. Uh, therefore, your CPU's clock speed must be supported by the motherboard and vice versa. So with that in mind, we need to talk about overclocking. Now, beware that with most systems, the CPU, the RAM, the motherboard can be overclocked to a degree. So overclocking essentially is pushing the CPU beyond its, um, beyond its design specifications. So you can gain a marginal increase in performance by doing this. So like for example, Intel's Turbo Boost technology allows the processor to, um, to dynamically run uh, above its rated speed. So it also allows a CPU to overclock uh, as needed. So overclocking basically increases the speed that the, um, that the clock runs uh, 
So because the clock runs faster, the CPU, the memory and the motherboard all run faster too. So in theory, this uh, provides better performance. However, uh, be aware that um, improved performance does come, uh, does come at a price. So overclock systems tend to run much hotter and consume uh, more electricity. So, and the increased temperature can significantly reduce the lifespan of the CPU as well as other components in the system. So in addition, if you push the CPU too fast, you'll probably experience um, some sort of system instability. So you need to decide whether the increase in performance is worth the shortened lifespan of the device, um, as well as the potential instability of the, um, of the system overall. So the next thing we're gonna be talking about is uh, multi-core processors. So in early CPUs, there was one processor within uh, each CPU package. So in other words, it only had a single core. So if you wanted um, really great performance from a computer, you, uh, you could purchase a special motherboard that had uh, two or more CPU sockets, uh, which allows you to implement multiple CPUs at the same time. Um, today, however, um, most CPUs have multiple processors or cores within the same CPU package. So implementing uh, multiple cores uh, dramatically improves the system performance. So the key thing to remember is that a multi-core CPU can execute more than one instruction at a time. So for example, if you have four cores within your CPU, each core can execute an instruction uh, concurrently. So instead of processing just one single instruction, the CPU can execute uh, maybe four instructions at, uh, at the same time. Um, so moving on from, from multi-core uh, processor, we're gonna now move on to multi-threading. So in addition to multiple cores, some CPUs also support uh, multi-threading. So multi-threading allows a single core uh, within a CPU to execute uh, two, uh, two instructions at the same time. So multi-threading can also increase system performance, especially if it's implemented within a uh, multi-core CPU. So for example, if you have a, a CPU that has four cores and each one of those cores is a multi-threading core, then that CPU can run eight instructions uh, concurrently. So now we're gonna move on to uh, a much more interesting topic and that is cooling the CPU. So let's discuss uh, cooling uh, the, the CPU. So when you work with modern CPUs, so you have to keep cooling foremost in your mind. So sometimes people turn their systems on for testing purposes without the CPU cooler installed. And I will tell you this right now, that is a very, very bad idea because modern CPUs generate a lot of heat. So heat is very, very bad for your computer systems. So an uncooled CPU will burn up in less than a minute. In fact, it'll burn up in a few seconds. So CPUs use heat sink, uh, heat sinks, fan, thermal paste, liquid, um, or fanless cooling systems to transfer heat uh, from the CPU to, uh, to the cooling unit. So ensure that you install a heat sink and fan before you ever turn on a system. So there are several different CPU uh, cooling options available. So uh, one, of the, one, of, one of the most common, um, so one of the most common options is to use um, a heat sink and this can be more of a passive form of CPU cooling. So the heat sink makes physical contact with the CPU, uh, which essentially increases the CPU surface area and thus allowing more heat uh, to be dissipated. So a heat sink alone can't uh, adequately cool a CPU. So if you're going to use a heat sink, then you should always use that um, in conjunction with, uh, with a fan. So the fan blows air over the heat sink uh, to increase the airflow. And by doing this, we remove more heat from the heat sink more quickly. So this is an example of, uh, of active cooling. So no matter which cooling option you use, you need to make sure that you use thermal paste. So thermal paste is absolutely critical because it facilitates the heat transfer between the CPU and the CPU cooler. Okay. So moving on from, from, cooling, the, um, from cooling the CPU, now, uh, now I want to talk about something that's uh, rather, uh, rather many students would be faced with in, uh, in the future. So, and this is, this is selecting the right CPU. Uh, 
So with all of the information in mind, so we're going to talk, uh, let, let's, let's end uh, this first part of the session uh, by discussing several uh, key criteria to, to remember when you're selecting an appropriate CPU um, in a new implementation or in a new uh, computer system. So first you need to identify the purpose of the system. You need to be sure that the CPU, your CPU that you select can perform the task that you want the system to perform. Um, also, you need to make sure that the CPU is supported by the motherboard. So, one, so with that, two considerations need to be taken into account. So first of all, um, is the CPU itself compatible with the socket and the motherboard? And secondly, will the motherboard BIOS or UEFI firmware uh, support that CPU? So, uh, so because a CPU may fit into the socket, uh, but that does not necessarily mean that the motherboard itself uh, will support it. So you also need to take uh, cost into account when you're selecting a CPU. So you need to decide uh, exactly how much performance you need um, versus how much of money you are willing to spend. Um, so the two big hitters in the CPU market are Intel and AMD. So the one thing that uh, I'd like to um, inform you is research is key. So an Intel CPU will only work with a compatible Intel supported motherboard. And the exact same thing applies uh, for AMD. Okay, so that pretty much brings us to the end of the first session um, of, the, of, of this webinar. So, so in this session, uh, I introduced you to the CPU. Uh, we talked about um, the role and the function of the CPU. Uh, we talked about the clock speeds, overclocking, multi-cores, uh, cooling, and lastly, uh, I explained the, uh, well, rather selecting the correct CPU for you. Um, so we're going to move on to, to session two. And in this session, we're going to be uh, mainly speaking about uh, troubleshooting the, um, the CPUs. So let's not, let's not, again, let's not delay uh, any further. So let's talk about troubleshooting um, a CPU. Okay. So troubleshooting a CPU is a little bit more uh, difficult than troubleshooting other devices uh, in the system. Um, that's mainly because CPUs aren't mechanical in nature. They don't have moving parts um, and they don't wear out with normal usage. So usually you can run a CPU for a very long time um, if, you take care, if you take care of it, provi uh, provided if you take care of it. Um, however, there are some factors that you need to, uh, or rather that that can cause uh, a CPU to fail prematurely. So here we're going to be reviewing some of those factors. Um, so the first one to, con to, to consider is, um, is electrostatic discharge or ESD. I'm sure this is a topic that many of you would have come across uh, in, in your courseware. So one issue that can, can cause uh, a CPU to fail prematurely is, um, is electrostatic discharge. So if you don't use the proper static prevention techniques, you can cause uh, or you could cause the uh, a discharge in static electricity through the leads on the bottom of the CPU, which can cause it to, to fail prematurely. So that so to keep so basically um, keeping this in mind to, or to prevent this from happening, um, you should use uh, a static mat when working uh, with CPUs and to ground yourself uh, to, to the static mat with, by, using, uh, by using the wrist strap. So another, uh, another issue that can arise is BIOS incompat uh, incompatibility. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about BIOS incompatibility um, issues. So this problem can occur if you decide to upgrade a system to use a faster CPU. So even though the CPU and the, and the motherboard socket may be an exact match, um, all the BIOS firmware on the motherboard may not be able to work with newer CPU, with a newer CPU. So essentially the newer CPU didn't exist when the BIOS firmware was written. So if this happens, uh, what we can do is we can re reinstall the original CPU, go to the manufacturer's website, um, and then verify that the newer CPU uh, is supported by the updated bio, uh, BIOS firmware. So usually it will be, but occasionally um, it, it won't. So if it is, uh, ensure that you download the latest BIOS update um, and install it, and then you can install the, um, the newer CPU. Um, so bearing in mind, if you are updating the BIOS firmware, you need to ensure that your PC is connected to a UPS because um, the BIOS is a very, very intricate thing. So if, uh, if there is a power surge or a power outage while the BIOS is uh, updating, there's a very strong chance that you could, um, what's called, let's call it a brick your motherboard. 
uh, which means it just becomes a paperweight. You cannot use it at all thereafter. So you need to ensure that you do connect it to a UPS or some sort of external power source before you perform a BIOS update. Uh, so the next, the next thing we're gonna move on to is um, installation issues. So you need to be aware of, of certain CPU installation issues. So they're commonly experienced uh, when you're upgrading to a new CPU or when you're building a new system from scratch. So there are some things to watch out for. So let's, let's discuss a couple of them. So make sure the CPU is compatible with the motherboard. I know we did speak about uh, compatibility um, in, in the previous, uh, previous session. So most motherboard vendors uh, publish a CPU compatibility list uh, for each motherboard model. So make sure that the CPU is seated properly in its socket and make sure that the CPU is seated flat, the locking mechanism is enabled, um, and the orientation of the CPU is correct. So you need to make sure that pin one on the CPU meets up with pin one on the socket. So a processor can sometimes be forced into a socket uh, with the incorrect pin alignment. Uh, but however, with, with newer, um, or with most of the new CPUs uh, are designed to prevent this uh, from happening. So, um, but if you fail to observe uh, these guidelines, uh, then there's, there's several symptoms that, that can occur. So for example, uh, well, failure to, to orient pin one in the CPU with pin one in the motherboard um, is likely gonna result in a short, uh, or a short circuit rather, sorry, um, that produces smoke. So if this happens, the CPU will probably be damaged and it's gonna need to be replaced. So if you fail to seat the CPU properly or if you install an incompatible CPU, uh, you may see no display when you power the system on. Uh, usually the system will beep once and, and then nothing will happen. So the power supply may switch on, uh, but the but post will not run uh, and the system just will simply will not boot. So if this happens, you need to first verify that the CPU is compatible uh, with the motherboard. Uh, and, and if it is, then verify that it's seated properly and locked into the CPU socket uh, on the motherboard. Okay, so those are some of the um, uh, some of the installation issues that uh, you need to that you do need to look out for. So if you do have, as I said, as we ended the first session, if you do have any questions, um, I will address them at the end of uh, this particular session. So uh, just for now, we're going to be moving on to um, on to another another issue that many people uh, can find themselves. Uh, a uh, rather sticky situation, let's call it. Um, and that's uh, overheating issues, okay. So we're gonna discuss CPUs overheating issues now. So this is probably the most common CPU problem you'll have to work with. So modern CPUs uh, tend, uh, well, modern CPUs uh, tend to produce a significant amount of heat and that heat must be dissipated properly um, or the CPU will eventually fail. So. These are some things to, to keep in mind to keep your, uh, to keep your CPU cool, okay? So always install the heatsink and fan on the, um, on the CPU. Never power on the system without them installed, not even for a few minutes. So your CPU will overheat. It will experience damage uh, within a few minutes. Well, considering we're, we're discussing more modern CPUs, it will actually cause a significant amount of damage within a few seconds. So, the other thing is always install a heatsink uh, and a fan on the CPU, or rather so we've already uh, never powered the system on without them being installed uh, for a minute. Um, so monitor the temperature of the CPU. Um, most motherboards implement uh, several temperature sensors that you can use um, to keep track of the system temperature rather. Uh, ensure the power supply and the CPU fans are working. So occasionally they will fail and if they do, the system will not be able to um, but rather to, to remove the heated air from the system. So if the temperature is run continuously high, um, we need to consider adding additional fans to the system. So remember that fans must work with and not uh, against each other. So, the, so one of the more common configurations um, is to install a fan in the front of the system that pushes air in, while the power supply fan uh, pulls air out of the system, so this uh, so this creates like a continuous flow um, of cooler air to the to the um, to the system. Uh, another very very um, common uh, common killer, let's say, of many computer systems is dust accumulation. So 
dust accumulation within the system can cause significant overheating. So over time, dust can accumulate in fans, uh, between heat, heat sink fins, uh, a lot of time within your, within your laptops um, and within um, exterior vent holes. So this accumulation uh, can dramatically uh, restrict airflow to the, uh, to the system. Uh, the reduced airflow results in correspondingly uh, reduced heat dissipation. So to fix this issue, um, visually inspect the interior of the system, identify um, areas where dust is accumulating. So you can use compressed air um, or use an anti-static vacuum uh, to, to remove the dust. Um, Another, top, another thing as well is to consider it's a failed processor. So it's possible that you may, uh, may have to work with a, a system where the CPU is, is malfunctioning, um, perhaps it overheated, and then as a result, it's just not stable anymore. Maybe it's, it's failed completely. So the best way to verify this um, in this case is to replace the, um, the suspect CPU with, uh, with a known good CPU of the same make and model. So if the known good processor works, uh, works properly or if it works fine in the system, then you know the original CPU um, is failing or is perhaps it's already dead. So CPUs are not something that the system administrator can, uh, can repair. So if a CPU is failing or if it's already failed, um, then pretty much the only choice that you have is to, um, is to replace, uh, rather is to replace the, um, the CPU itself. Okay. Um, and that, that brings us to the end of the, of, of the second session and we're pretty much nearly the uh, nearly at the end of the um of the webinar as a whole so we did in this uh, this lesson we talked about troubleshooting uh cpus dangers of um of electrostatic discharge on cpus bias and compatibility installation issues um overheating issues uh with, with the cpu and um pretty much as, as the same as the um as the end of the first session if you do have any any questions for me um the floor will be open um, again for the next uh, five minutes. So you can again use the um, the Q and A tab if you do have any any questions at all for me. Um, I will I will take the next five minutes to, um, to to answer any questions you have. So please, by all means. <laughs>so an easy way to check the temperature of the computer CPU is to boot into the BIOS um, and locate the hardware monitor monitor section. It, it's going to differ from uh, from motherboard manufacturer to motherboard manufacturer. So um, there would be a hardware monitor section uh, depending on, like I said, depending on the um, the motherboard that you are using. So there will be a, a, a hardware. A hard, well, the tab might be called hardware or hardware monitoring. Um, it's going to differ and um, that's that's essentially where you would find um, the temperature of, of the of the CPU. Uh, I know, like with the more expensive or the uh, more higher end components or, or motherboards, they will track um, of various temperatures within within your system, not just your um, not just your CPU, but also uh, the different parts of your motherboard as well. Um, even even your G uh, graphics card or GPU as well. So um, the the key area that you can that you can um, that you can view is the is the bios uh, yes uh, at, at any time whenever you are testing a cpu you absolutely have to have to apply the heatsink um, and proper cooling methods uh, in, because what I like like i did explain uh, a bit earlier on is that if you were to place a CPU um, on the motherboard itself without a heatsink, uh, without thermal paste, without a fan, that CPU is going to heat up uh, to, from let's say zero is from zero degrees to just over a hundred degrees within a matter of seconds. So it it there is a very strong possibility that you can fry the um, that you can fry the CPU within a matter of seconds if you do not apply the appropriate uh, cooling cooling methods. So there are a number of different manufacturers that uh, manufacture, uh, but you can use a heat sink. Um, there's also the uh, liquid cooling route, which is a much more intricate, much more expensive uh, method of cooling that's normally used on, on, on higher end computers. Um, so there are a number of different uh, cooling options available to you, but you absolutely do need to apply the uh, proper cooling methods anytime you are testing a CPU. Oh.
So water cooling, yes, it, it is um, it is a lot uh, a lot uh, more different to, to using a fan. Um, though the same cooling method, uh, same best cooling practices uh, do do apply. So with liquid cooling does use um, it, it does use a special liquid um, that runs to to a radiator, and that's essentially what um, uh, well basically what what let's let's say pulls pulls the heat from the CPU itself. It's a much more um, expensive method of uh, of cooling a system, uh, but it's generally used by um, by individuals who who like to push their system beyond. Uh, uh, beyond the recommended specifications, um, it's generally used by people who like who like to um, who like to specialize in in, in overclocking their their, their CPUs um, in gaming in video editing. So it does it does differ um, from from a fan. It does use fans. The radiator itself uh, does need to um, need to have fans uh, installed onto it in order to to aid in. Um, in in drawing air, uh, well, cool air into the system, and then dispersing the uh, and then the other fans work with dispersing it. Uh, but liquid cooling, yes, does um, it does differ a lot from just merely using um, a heatsink and a fan. Okay, and I believe that that will bring us to the end of. Uh, I do apologize for not uh, for if I wasn't able to address everyone's um, uh, everyone's questions. Uh, please, by all means, um, if you can pop your questions to me uh, via uh, via an email. Um, I would, I would, I would definitely answer your questions um, uh, to my email. You will find my email uh, address um, will appear on screen uh, right now. So please, if you do have, um, if you can, to all of your questions um, that you have with regards to CPUs or, any, or anything, anything cost related, not just limited to the CPU itself, uh, please do feel free to reach out to me uh, via email or give us a call as well. I'm more than welcome. To, uh, sorry, um, I'm more than willing to 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 go the extra mile to to assist you um, in your courseware. And I'd just like to thank everyone for, for attending the, um, the very first webinar. It's going to be the first of many webinars, in fact. So um, there are more webinars that, I'm going to, that I am currently planning to, uh, to host in future that's going to cover different topics. Um, so but we will send out an invitation or a reminder uh, of, the, of the future webinars. And I really do hope you found uh, this webinar to be, uh, to be insightful, to be, in, uh, to be informative. And if you do have any... Um, any queries regarding your course, please do feel free to to, to reach out to me. Uh, I'm more than happy to to assist you with your course. Okay, so uh, and to to end, thank you all. Um, thank you all for for attending the uh, the webinar. I really really appreciate um, every single one of you uh, attending. And as I said, the uh, recording uh, will be made available to to you all um, to to access. Uh, well, if you want to watch the video, the webinar in future, a recording will be made available. So, uh, thank you all for for attending, and uh, I will speak. I will see you all soon. Take care. Bye guys.